Alrighty peoples, this is Ross. So in today's video, I got a, a really good one for you. We're going to talk about how to grow figs more successfully in the Pacific Northwest, in the United Kingdom. What are some things that you guys can do? Uh, not only the growing techniques uh, or a methodology of growing, but also the varieties, the genetics that really play a big part in this puzzle. And if you don't have both, honestly, I think you're missing out. So uh, we're going to talk about both. Part one of this video, we'll talk about the techniques, the methodology, also the really uh, the, the difficulties, essentially, of growing figs in a climate like the United Kingdom, uh, like a mild climate in the Pacific Northwest. And then part two will be about the genetics and not just the varietal recommendations, but also the criteria for those varieties. Now, before we get into all that, I have to preface a couple things. The, the, uh, when I use the term Pacific Northwest, that's a pretty large area. And I'm, I'm mostly talking about the very mild areas of the Pacific Northwest. There's definitely some areas in the Pacific Northwest that are very conducive to growing figs. And it's, uh, one, I would argue, one of the best places to grow figs in the United States. So you certainly don't need to listen to um, parts of this video if indeed you live in one of those warm dry places within the Pacific Northwest that does actually get a lot of Sun what I'm referring to when I use the term Pacific Northwest is something similar to the United Kingdom so British Columbia Canada um, maybe even you go as far south as San Francisco places that don't get a whole lot of Sun maybe there's a lot of cloud cover also places that are quite mild in the summer so typically you're mild in the winter but also you don't really have a whole lot of heat in the summertime and then maybe uh, in addition to all that it actually could be quite rainy where you're at in the summertime to make things even worse so when I use that term just uh, keep in mind that that's what we're talking about and we're not talking about some of the more fig conducive places within the Pacific Northwest also, I should preface that I have really have no experience growing figs in the Pacific Northwest. I only have experience growing them here in the Philadelphia area. However, I can definitely connect the dots uh, and really infer a lot of what I'm using here and how that translates well over to somewhere like the Pacific Northwest. There's certainly some good um, conclusions that can be drawn uh, based off of my experience growing them here in the Philadelphia area. Also, I have quite a few friends and I've talked to a lot of few people over the years that are growing figs in the Pacific Northwest in the United Kingdom. And certainly um, I've tried my best to learn from them and also if they had questions, aid them in this particular topic. Uh, by the way, this topic has been a long time coming. I know a lot of you guys have been asking for this video for years. So happy to finally have been doing this and then also we did a video similar to this um, but for people in the tropics so people who are interested that live in a, a tropical environment that haven't necessarily uh, been too adept or really want a good starting point at growing figs in the tropics I just put out a video on that topic um, but for the most part a lot of my videos are tailored to either a very specific climate like this one like this video or it's really just tailored to my own climate and of course you can take certain pieces from my own videos my own climate and use them in your own but uh, certainly it would be a lot more helpful if I made a specific video like this that was tailored exactly to a particular climate so I would argue as well I just want to say this one thing that um, Growing figs in the Pacific Northwest or in the United Kingdom is probably the most difficult place to grow figs. Uh, you really don't have that really great environment that they love to be in, like the Mediterranean, where it's warm, it's dry, it's sunny, maybe even the desert. Figs are certainly very uh, drought tolerant. It's uh, kind of amazing. In fact, they're really similar to a cactus and how they're able to store a large amount of water in their branches in their trunk so growing them in the Pacific Northwest is kind of really the opposite of what you want and what figs want so that's why I think it's really probably the most challenging place in the entire country of the United States 
to grow them. Uh, you could even make an argument for the far northeast, northeast, like maybe Maine or somewhere that has a very short season climate. Uh, but at least here in the northeast, at least where I live, and the big differences between myself and maybe you know, somewhere like Seattle is that you guys have a longer season, a much longer growing season than myself. You guys start roughly a month ahead of me. Um, your average last frost is roughly a month ahead of mine. And then maybe even your first frost is actually uh, potentially around the same time or maybe even a couple weeks to a month after mine. So you guys potentially have another 45-ish days, let's estimate, of growing season. The other large difference is that I have a ton more heat in the summer. So it's not very mild here. It's uh, quite extreme. So we go from zero degrees in the wintertime, potentially, to uh, 100, over 100 degrees sometimes in the summer. And consistently, we can definitely see temperatures over 85 for, I would say, you know, a large part of the summer. Um, Whereas, let's say in the Pacific Northwest, you guys may not even see 80 degrees, and it, it's quite rare. So, uh, you know, definitely in different parts, obviously that's going to change. But there's really a big difference in, in heat and how quickly you reach those extremes. So let's say you do reach 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, how quickly within the season are you getting to that point? Um, what are your growing degree days like? And that's really important, too, because I, in my opinion, the most important thing that you guys should be considering in these climates is actually the heat. You can't change the sun. You know, uh, it's unfortunate that it could be a cloudy day and therefore you're not getting as much sunlight as you would be. Or also the sunlight isn't necessarily warming up the soil as much. Um, so not only does the sunlight affect the photosynthesis of the plants, but it really plays a big part in the overall uh, soil temperatures that we're going to really strongly consider in this video. And that's really what the key is. It's not necessarily the heat, the ambient temperatures, but it's really about the soil temperatures. If you can get the soil temperatures to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit consistently for as long as possible, that's going to create the most optimal conditions in your climate. Because you have a long season, right? You guys, like I said, your, your season's f almost 45 days, let's estimate, longer than my own, um, which I already struggle here by my, my own right of getting figs to ripen within my six-month growing season. It's 180 days long. So if I can do it in 180 days, why shouldn't you, be, you guys be able to do it within 45 days, right? That's really the big issue is like you guys have the amount of growing days, but you don't have the heat within those days to actually ripen the figs within the allotted time possible. So that's why a lot of people really depend on Breva producers or San Pedro types or figs like Desert King, which we'll talk about in part two of this video. Um, so really, I'm telling you from my own experience, the way that I can get earlier figs is if I can increase the soil temperatures earlier in the season and also consistently throughout the growing season because as I said, 80 degrees Fahrenheit in the soil creates the most optimal metabolism for our trees. Figs need, and every plant needs, just like us as humans, we want a most, the most optimal metabolic rate, do we not? Our body is constantly in a thing called homeostasis to actually cool us down and sweat or warm us up and start to shiver if we're actually too cold. So we want to be at that optimal temperature. It's the same thing for these plants, right? Same thing with these cold-blooded insects. Why are mosquitoes not really present in the winter? It's because they're cold-blooded. They need those warmer temperatures to have a higher metabolic rate. So if we are not getting our fig trees to the right soil temperature, and that's really what dictates that metabolic rate, guys. It's not the ambient temperatures. I really want to make that clear. The ambient temperatures do play a large part of getting the soil temperatures, and also probably some other things that Maybe we'll talk about in this video, but certainly we want to be really focusing on the soil. So really that comes down to then if we have the a right amount of days in our season, we actually have an excess amount of days in our season, and you guys I'm talking about, then how do we get the right amount of heat to actually make it so that 
our figs are growing optimally in those allotted days? Well, there's a lot of things you guys can do. I mean, I've talked a lot about this on the channel over the years, and this is kind of how this all ties in from what I'm doing to you guys. And you can see from this video here, this is my yard uh, at the end of the summer, at the beginning of the fall, when we're starting actually to, things are starting to go dormant. They're really at the height of the season and, uh, and you know, the height of the jungle madness that was my backyard. So you can see we have a house back here that's creating ge uh, geothermal heating. Anything that can create some ambient temperatures, extra ambient heat, is going to really be helpful. That geothermal heating, what it does is, not only does it heat up during the day and radiate heat throughout the day, but it also holds on to that heat throughout the nighttime and actually releases that heat during the night. So those nighttime temperatures are really valuable, and a lot of people forget about that because it's not just about the day. It's the, actually the average of the temperatures between the nighttime temperatures and the daytime temperatures. All of that adds up and counts towards the soil temperatures, right? The soil temperatures are more stable than, let's say, the air temperatures, right? The air might go from 80 degrees Fahrenheit down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but the soil temperatures may only drop about 5-ish degrees. Um, but if you can keep the nighttime temperatures higher in addition to the daytime temperatures, that soil temperature is not going to fluctuate nearly as much. So it's really key to use things like ge geothermal heating which is exactly why I have them so close to the house. This is exactly why I have them on the patio. We also have over here, because this is the patio section right here, we also have a wall right here. This is a concrete wall that also creates geothermal heating. In addition, we have things on the soil like bricks and rocks and things that absorb heat during the day and release it at night and keep those soil temperatures warmer. Um, also, by the way, this is the warmest part of my yard. So not only am I planting these things, these trees, in the warmest area of my yard, or am I using things like geothermal heating, but I'm also planting them in the warmest spot. How do I know it's the warmest spot in my yard? Well, I've done, one of, I've done actually two of these things. One, I've gone ac across my yard at different times of the year, and I've taken soil temperatures. And I know, based on my soil temperature readings, where my yard has the warmest soil. I also know by when it snows and wherever the snow melts first, that's where it is the warmest in my yard. So different areas of my yard I've designated depending largely actually where the snow has melted. Maybe you don't have snow, you got to take the soil temperatures at different times of the year. This is my southern exposure in my yard. The southern exposure in the northern hemisphere certainly is going to be the warmest area. It's going to have the most sunlight, and it's going to have the most heat. Now, let's say your southern exposure doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight because maybe you have trees or shade that's actually blocking the light. Well, then you want to plant them on the west side of your house because the west side of your house or the west side of your property is going to get uh, the warmer light, also those different color temperatures, which we'll get into in a minute. But that, those warmer um, temperatures, let's say, in the evening, in the afternoon, are really going to compound and actually give you uh, more soil temperatures than, let's say, the east side of your property. Certainly, the north side is probably a really bad idea. Uh, the east side is more about growth, right, as the color temperatures, depending on the time of the day, it works like just like this for us as humans, right? The certain colors, blue light, yellow light in the morning, tells us our bodies to set our circadian rhythm so that we can actually get the right melatonin production so many hours later in the day. Um, it's the same thing with these plants, is that they actually respond better in the morning. In the morning light, they respond better with growth. In the afternoon, they actually respond better with flowering. So it's a really good idea, not only just in terms of heat, right? But also those different colors that light spectrum, uh, the color spectrum of light in the afternoon is actually help promoting flowering, which is actually what a fig is. It's an inside out flower. So even though you don't see the flowers, they're actually the figs. So if we can promote flowering later in the day with the afternoon light, we're going to be better off. Because really what we want to do is not only do we want our soil temperatures as warm as possible, but the reason for that is we want to have our figs form as early as possible. 
not only do we want them to form as early as possible, but we want them to have the right heat throughout the season so that we can actually have them ripen as early as possible. Now, depending on where you guys live, we've, I've talked a lot about this, right? We can do things like pinching or we can do things like count the number of days after we have seen fruit set on our trees. And after either pinching or seeing the fruit set on our trees, depending on where you live, there's a difference in the number of days that that fig will actually ripen. So as an example, uh, here in my climate, um, a fig like, let's say, Ron de Bordeaux is one of the most earliest figs that you can ripen main crop off of. Uh, Ron de Bordeaux, a standard, by the way, hi highly recommend it. We'll get to that at the end of this video. But Ron de Bordeaux, will ripen roughly about 70 days after I pinch it here in this climate. Or instead of pinching, actually will ripen 70 days after I see the fig form on the tree. So that tells me one thing. If it takes me 70 days here, I can count the number of days in the future. And I know this from experience of years now of keeping track of this sort of data. Is it gonna be 70 days where you guys live? No. And that's kind of the unfortunate part is that let's say I lived in California. Well, actually, if Southern California, let's say that 70 days may not take 70 days. It might actually take 60 days. Let's say I live in the in the south. It might take 60 days rather than 70. The Pacific Northwest, unfortunately, instead of 70 days, it may take you 100 days. So it's really quite unfortunate. Um, once you sort of have that realization of like, oh, I have a longer season, but I don't have enough heat in my season to actually get that 70 days that, let's say, Ross is getting in his climate. And the reason for that is the heat. It's all in that soil temperature. It's not the ambient temperatures. Although the ambient temperatures affect the soil, we need to be running at a more optimal soil temperature, that more optimal metabolism. If we're running at the most optimal metabolism throughout most of the year, even as early as possible, even in, let's say, March, when you guys actually have your last frost, you need to be increasing those soil temperatures as much as humanly possible because there's two different, there's two different things and ways that we measure how long it's going to take these figs to ripen. One is you can just count. You can also count, like I said, 70 days, but you can also count the amount of days it takes for the fig to form. Now, you may actually guys have noticed, depending on if you are part of a fig community, you may notice from other growers that people like myself, we may form the figs later than you guys. They may show up on our tree at a much later date. However, they ripen earlier. And that's just quite a strange phenomenon, right? Because you guys actually, you'll, you'll form your figs very early in the season. Uh, because the requirement to actually form figs is really quite low. Here it's about 550 growing degree days. So if I look at this tool right here that Cornell has actually put out, and you guys can look this up. I don't know of a tool that you can use in, let's say, uh, Seattle or the Pacific Northwest or even California. I do know this is really a Northeast only tool. And essentially, if you use this tool, you can calculate when exactly you get about 550 growing degree days. Now here uh, in Ithaca, New York, not here, but here in the Northeast, 550 growing degree days on the 30 year normal is going to be roughly about June 7th. So about um, by about June 7th, someone in Cornell or in Ithaca, I should say, is going to see the fig formation on their trees by about on average, June 6th, June 7th. Now, how many days later is that gonna to take to ripe? Well, from this point, on average, you're gonna see about 90 days later, your fig is gonna be ripe on your tree. And that's other another big point that we'll get to is that not only do these figs ripen at different times, but they're largely affected by the amount of heat, right? So uh, not only, let's say there's a fig that's an early season fig, a mid season fig, or a late season fig, Part of the reason for that is that actually they take longer to ripen after they have formed. So some figs, let's say, only take 70 days to ripen or 80 days to ripen. Some take 120 days to ripen, even here in this climate. 
So it's really quite difficult. Um, like I said, if you you don't have the right genetics, it really makes a big deal. It's a big difference. Um, all right, so now here's the issue though. I don't necessarily know how many growing degree days it takes in somewhere like Seattle for you guys to see fruit formation. Um, I don't think it's actually even 550 growing degree days because based on what I was looking at during my research here, by the time you guys get 550 growing degree days, it's actually a little bit later in the season than I would have thought. So it's probably less than that for you guys. And the way that you can kind of use this tool instead is actually change the base of this to figure out exactly how many growing degree days it would take. So now if I change the base to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm now actually looking at uh, a May 19th date for Ithaca, New York, which would probably be about right if you are using this tool to translate it into somewhere like Seattle. So that's roughly about 20 days earlier than what this tool was saying. And it's, all, it's really going to be up to you guys to figure this out. You know, it's 550 growing degree days here. Is it 550 for you guys? I don't think so. I think it's less than that. And which is really goes to show you that growing degree days is not really the end all be all for everybody. Um, it just is going to take uh, the same amount of days roughly no matter where you live, using a 50 degree Fahrenheit base, you guys are gonna roughly ripen figs at the same time I will, given the same amount of growing degree days. So let's say a fig takes about 2,400 growing degree days for it to be ripe. In Ithaca, New York, that's gonna be roughly about September 26th. The same thing for you guys, around 2,400 days, maybe it's actually 2,600 rather than 2,400 for you because you don't have those heat units that uh, make a bigger difference. Now I've, I've sort of, this is a great tool to use, but it definitely has its downsides. And as I have sort of said publicly before on the, on the fig communities is that there's really a bigger difference between, as I've said, 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, even 80 degrees Fahrenheit to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I think the, the multiplier in a sense, even though there is no multiplier um, using growing degree days. But I do believe that maybe we need to change the base. Maybe the base should be, I don't know, 60. Maybe it should even be 40. I have to do the math and figure this out. But essentially, I, I definitely believe that there's a higher value to a 90 degree temperature uh, exponentially than there is an 80 degree value and even exponentially than there is a 70 degree, 70 degree value. So every little temperature really adds up and makes a huge, huge difference towards the actual fruit set and how many days it takes for those figs to ripen on your tree. So yeah, you guys might get the same amount of growing degree days at the end of the season, let's say, or something like that. But in the amount of time it took you, it was just a lot longer to, to achieve the same amount of growing degree days. So if you can, you know, in this chart here, in the same, you know, in a, in a larger amount of time, actually achieve the same, or, the same amount as I am, you're going to have a lot more success. Um, so I think that's sort of essentially really what I wanted to get at here with all of this. The heat is just so, so important. So back to some other things we can do, like I said, geothermal heating. Um, planting them in the warmest spot of your yard. The other really big tip, and this is probably the biggest tip of the entire video, and if you don't do this, I don't know how, I, I can't help you. I can't, I can't help you anymore, because this is it. This is where all the money's at. Essentially, what you need to do is plant your fig tree above grade. Not only do you need to plant it above grade, but you need to construct a mound that's roughly a foot to two foot high and plant the tree within that mound, at the top of that mound. You guys don't have any problems with having a very extreme winter time, for the most, most of you, I should say. So planting a fig tree above grade, exposing the root system to colder temperatures in the winter time, is not going to be a big deal, as it is here. Um, even here, it's not necessarily the biggest deal because I'm in a zone seven. If I could plant all my fig trees in a berm that was two feet high, I would. And the big reason for that is, again, those soil temperatures. It's kind of like planting them in a raised bed. If you've ever grown, you know, 
vegetables in a raised bed as I have back here, you know that anything that loves those warmer soil temperatures is going to love that raised bed. They're really going to take off. Why? Because earlier in the season, they have those warmer soil temperatures then translating to a higher metabolic rate. So it's really quite simple. Just plant your fig tree higher, as, higher as, as high as you can get it. Uh, I would even recommend growing them in containers. Obviously, if you can plant the tree in the ground, I would. And I would plant the tree in a very high berm or high mound um, to essentially get the tree as much soil temperatures as possible, as early as possible in the spring. Because getting those temperatures as early as possible is going to exponentially compound, essentially, into the future. So all those growing degree days that start out very early in the season makes a huge difference by the end. So everything you do in the beginning, as I said, it compounds in interest more and more as you go throughout the season. So I would just um, highly recommend uh, you guys invest in something like that. Take the extra time to dig a hole or create a mound or something like that. You know, that really is going to go a long way towards your future. Let's say you have a tree that's in the ground already and you can't dig it up and plant it into a, a big mound like that. Like I said, you could over time keep adding soil around the base of the tree. Um, and eventually, let's say your tree could maybe put out roots into that area into that soil that you keep adding but inevitably i don't know if that's really going to be the greatest solution and i know people have said that in the past well they've made that argument here and they've said well instead of planting it in a mound i'll just plant it deeply so i know it'll survive in the winter and then i'll just mound up the soil over time i don't think that's really a great idea uh, that's going to really contradict what you're trying to achieve and it may even be impossible or very difficult to achieve. So um, getting as much of that root system above grade is going to be really key for that heat, those heat units, the soil temperatures that you're, you're looking for. So that's number one. Um, <clears throat> number two, you may struggle with water. We've talked a lot about water on my channel. You know, a lot of this is gonna be about a consistent soil moisture to achieve the most optimum fruit quality. So the mound actually, believe it or not, is really gonna help with that. Uh, you guys can, without a doubt, um, use a mound to help shed water away if it's in excess. Really, you're looking for roughly somewhere between 20 to 25, maybe 30 inches of rain annually to have a, a fig tree that really doesn't need any water um, that will be able to uh, put out decent fruit quality for you. So certainly that's something you want. I know there's a lot of mist. There's a lot of fog. There's a lot of humidity, perhaps, in these climates, the Pacific Northwest, the United Kingdom. What you're really going to look for is fruits, varieties that can withstand that mist. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, the last little point I want to mention, actually, about the techniques and the methodology is that I've actually put out a full methodology of growing figs in cold slash shorter season climates, you guys would fall into that category of shorter season climates. This is the video for you because what we're doing in here is we're essentially setting up low tunnels. We're growing our figs in greenhouses. Yeah, that's going to reduce the amount of sunlight. And in fact, if it's quite dreary and sad in your climate, you're not going to have as much of that greenhouse effect that you want. But certainly over time, this is going to be better than having no greenhouse. So for me, I cut them back to a very low height. I throw these low tunnels over top, and this really helps warm the soil. And by warming that soil, again, they're off to a very, very early head start. Uh, me, as an example here, by doing this in the Philadelphia area, I'm able to roughly get figs to ripen about a month to a month and a half earlier than normal. Um, I think a conservative estimate here that I'm going to start seeing main crop would actually be somewhere between July 15th and August 1st, which is really quite incredible because that would then compete and actually beat out a lot of the potted trees that I have on the patio. 
which uh, are also above grade and should have access to more of those soil temperatures. So uh, that's another really good data point, by the way, guys, is that this is all very obvious and proven because you can compare an in-ground tree to a potted tree. Why do the potted trees ripen earlier? It's all about the excess heat. The sides of the pot are black. So if you're growing them in pots, by the way, use black pots. You want the soil to be warmer in your climate. So if, uh, if you're growing them in pots, they're above grade, they're more subject to warmer ambient temperatures, which then warm the soil and therefore should ripen at an earlier date, roughly two weeks, two to four weeks earlier than something that could be in the ground. And that's uh, pretty much standard across the board, almost no matter where you guys live, it seems like. Um, the potted trees, assuming the soil temperature is more optimal, will ripen about two weeks earlier. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it sort of sounds like a no-brainer. Um, I don't know how much results you guys will see, but certainly I think it's going to be significant. Doing this, getting these warmer temperatures is going to be insanely, insanely important, I think. It's going to make a huge difference. How much of a difference? I don't know. But that's sort of the, you know, the big reason why we're doing this is that a lot of you guys in the Pacific Northwest rely on Brabus and rely on uh, San Pedro types like Desert King. And it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, that's a great way to do it, and I can't argue with it. But certainly you could grow a whole host of different main crop varieties. If done properly, you could potentially ripen figs maybe even earlier than you could get some Brabus if you do it correctly. Um, I have no doubt you know, that this low tunnel system just by itself is going to net me about a month's earlier production. So that's, you know, that's really incredible right there in itself. Um, and certainly this is easy to do. It's affordable. Anybody can do it. Um, highly suggest you check out this video. So <clears throat> some of the next, the other things is we talked about water, the sunlight, we can't really do a whole, whole lot about. It's really all about that heat. So there's the methodology, guys. There's the, the growing techniques that I highly recommend. Let's move on to part two of this video now, which is about the varieties and the varietal characteristics. Now, I certainly have a pretty darn good starting point for you guys that anybody can use here in my spreadsheet. These are the varieties I, I recommend the most just based off of uh, my particular climate. Now, you guys are probably very likely, you're a lot drier than myself. So maybe you can get away with some figs that... Uh, Maybe they'll ripen earlier, but they won't necessarily have the rain resistance that I require here. Now, if you have a climate that has a lot of mist, a lot of fog, a lot of humidity, you certainly are going to want to grow a fig that doesn't split, that doesn't crack, that has a very high bricks. The higher the bricks, the better it's going to withstand the humidity and actually be able to ripen a higher quality fig where you guys live. And that's sort of where the the sunlight comes into play is that a lot of you guys don't have a whole lot of sunlight and your figs end up looking quite strange maybe they don't have enough bricks in them and certainly they can spoil very easily uh maybe they can even mold or ferment so you know it's really important i think in my mind i would just stick with the varieties that i've recommended something that's quite rain resistant uh, humidity resistant that indeed has a very high bricks to it that almost nothing can go wrong with it and that the varieties that you're going to want to look out for are these early season varieties i wouldn't even bother with these late or very late varieties you know figs that are the next best thing or that are getting a lot of hype that are getting a lot of attention because they supposedly taste very good um, or they look like they taste very good you know those are not the figs you guys want it's really unfortunate but a fig like black Madeira, you may never even ripen in your climate without some sort of season extension. You just won't. Without really doing it in the method I, I used even here, it's difficult for even me to get black Madeira to ripen here. So I would just highly recommend not playing into that hype, selecting varieties that are known to be proven to be early and rain resistant. We talked a lot about rain resistance. We talked a lot about you know, varieties that ripen early. Here's a whole category of figs that ripen early. There's a whole list even longer than this that you could recommend. Um, things like LSU Purple, 
things like uh, Brianzolo Rosso, figs like Figu Jean. There's a whole list of them that maybe in the future, if you want to see the spreadsheet, uh, you can just go down in the description of the video, by the way. But I'll probably update this and make a, a longer list here of early figs. You can also do some research and find out which ones are quite early. A lot of the LSU figs are going to be a good bet. Figs like Long to Do. LSU Champagne, Improved Celeste. Here's what I would also recommend with your varieties. Go for either the Bravas or the main crop. Don't go for both. If you go for both, you're going to struggle with one or the other. So you're going to get some Bravas. It's going to be a guarantee. But if you ripen Bravas, it's going to be very unlikely you're going to get any main crop. That's going to delay your main crop production because all that energy has to be focused into ripening those Bravas. So don't do that. If you're ripening figs for main crop, like Improved Celeste, Malta Black, Ronde Bardot, not that they will produce many Brabas if you ever even see them, but certainly don't even let them develop. Take them off as soon as you see them uh, because you're going to get hammered like that. Same thing with Violette de Bordeaux. It's a really great Braba producer, and I probably would recommend that for Brabas, but if you're growing that one particularly for main crop, take off all the Brabas. Um, all right, so you definitely want something early. You could venture into something that's mid-season, depending on how mid-season, how reliable it actually is. And also depending on how much success you're having, right? This is all gonna be an experiment for you, right? I've never done this myself. I've obviously done it here, but I've never done it in your climate. So all the things I'm recommending are good recommendations, but you don't know until you try. And anyone arguing against anything I'm saying, again, you don't know until you try. So. I'd recommend that if you want to get really crazy with this, you could try some of these varieties and see what happens in the methods that I've been mentioning and see if they'll ripen for you. This is probably as far as I go though. I wouldn't go into the late section. I wouldn't go into the very late section. You got to do your research, unfortunately, to figure out what figs ripen in these categories. You know, there's quite a bit of them. Um, so, you know, it's not like there's quite a bit of, there is quite a bit of early figs. So it's not like you're too limited, but certainly I wouldn't waste my time in these two categories here whatsoever. Um, and again, I'd also really pay attention to, you know, the rain resistance, the split resistance. If we go back and look at this blog post I made here uh, last year, actually we talked about the most important varietal characteristics for high and consistent fruit quality. The, f the three most important things are things like ripening period and ripening succession, rain resistance, drying capabilities, higher bricks, and then number three is actually the hang time. So in terms of you guys, where does all this fall in for you is that the ripening period is the most important thing. If it doesn't ripen early, it's not going to ripen at all. You're not going to get any fruit. So why even bother? Right? Also, ripening succession can be very, very important for you. So not only a fig that ripens early, but a fig that ripens a lot of figs at once and has a shorter crop window. So a crop window is if you time the amount of days, you count the number of days between the first fig that ripens and the last fig that ripens on that tree, how many days is that? A fig that has roughly a 30-day crop window is quite is quite good. That's really what you're looking for. There are other figs actually, believe it or not, that have a 20 day crop window that I've ripened that are very short. And that's something that you should really pay attention to because it's not only important to look out for the first fig, but the last fig, because at the end of the year, you may have a lot of figs on your tree that never ripen. And depending on the variety, that could really, really play a big part. Uh, you could also have a fig that let's say is quite early, like let's say Ron de Bordeaux, but maybe it has a larger crop window and therefore it ripened early, but you didn't get all of your crop. You didn't ripen the entire thing in time. So really a key thing there to consider. The rain resistance we talked about, I really do recommend something with good drying capabilities, something that can withstand a light mist is certainly something that has good, significant drying capabilities. Varieties like Rosalino, Verdino del Nord, Neruciello de Elba. Neruciello de Elba is probably one of the best varieties that you guys can grow, I imagine, in somewhere like the UK or the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> and then hang time is something definitely to consider as well, but I wouldn't say it's really as significant as 
the other two categories that I mentioned. Assuming it's drier in your climate, you're not struggling with rain, you could deal with a larger hang time, a longer hang time, and it wouldn't bother you nearly as much. But certainly if you are dealing with rain, you do have a lot of mist. A shorter hang time is definitely something that you're going to want. <clears throat> now, let's see here. That's mostly what I wanted to talk about, about these varieties here, the criteria. We talked about getting them to ripen early and a short crop window, a short hang time, the rain resistance we're talking about. We talked about some varieties that I do recommend. I would highly suggest looking at this fig here called Iranian Candy. It's probably the most reliable fig I've ever ripened. Yellow Nietzsche's is also extremely, extremely early. Um, <clears throat> Ronde Bardot is, of course, Pastelier, Albo. Malta Black, all of these are extremely early varieties that I'd highly recommend. You could also throw in things like LSU Huye and LSU Tiger. Negretta is also extremely early. Long the Long the Dute, the Daloso is quite early. Um, <clears throat> and then I would also strongly consider some Breba producers. So, you know. Uh, White Marseille actually can, uh, I believe, produce some Brebas, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe maybe I'm wrong on that. But uh, certainly Long de Duke can. Um, certainly uh, Desert King is a great idea. Uh, Villa de Bordeaux is easy to find and produces a lot of high-quality Breba. So I would highly recommend certainly something that's going to produce you some good Brebas, like Desert King, Long de Duke, Villa de Bordeaux. I mean, those are probably my three top choices there for Brebas. You could also get your something, yourself something called an English brown turkey, which will actually produce a high quality Breba. Um, <clears throat> and as the trees get more mature, they produce more and more Breba. So that's really important to consider there. There's a ton of, ton of varieties, a ton of genetics here that you guys could look at uh, that would hopefully fall in this category here. So um, yeah, I want to thank you guys out there for watching. I think this really gives you guys a good starting point, a place to uh, to look at least. When people ask me this question, I can send them this video, and I know a lot of you guys are going to benefit from this. Um, there's a really just a crap ton of good information in this video that I've learned over the years. Essentially, I could even name this video, you know, how to ripen earlier figs or, or why ripening earlier figs is key so really anybody not only in the pacific northwest united kingdom but also anybody trying to find and ripen earlier figs like somewhere maybe let's say in maine you know massachusetts people who are north of me they're really going to struggle with getting those figs to ripen in time and, and certainly this video could help those people out uh without a doubt so yeah i i wish everybody success i hope somebody will message me your progress in these climates to see what it is that uh, maybe you've already been doing some of the things I've mentioned just based off of other videos I've done um, and hopefully you guys can give me some feedback on uh, how you're doing in these particular climates all right take care guys I hope everybody stays safe happy happy and healthy and uh, we'll see you for the next one all right take care